Welcome everybody to today's class. Today we're doing a lesson on Spinoza. So if you're looking for English classes or vocabulary or grammar, I'm sorry, we're going to be doing Spinoza today and we're taking this book, Ethics. Another version of this book is The Ethics of Spinoza. This one's actually translated by a guy called Runes, Dagobah Runes. Um, and if anybody's interested in reading this book, I do recommend using this book first. It's been edited in certain ways that make it a lot more readable. Remember that Spinoza uses something that he calls the geometric method. Now, what he means is he's using a very similar method to Euclid in the way that he sets out his arguments. There are a lot of proposi propositions and corollaries and proofs. And so he's trying to use the same method as Euclid. And that means that the original is rather hard to read, but it becomes much easier to read if you've read it like this first. Um, so I do recommend this book, the Runes version of the Ethics of Spinoza. It does capture the spirit of Spinoza. Um, in a, and I think it, it's perhaps a better book to start with. I, I certainly tried that and didn't really enjoy it, then tried this and then tried that and I did enjoy it but it's a good introduction. So this is just going to focus on chapter three of Spinoza's um, book, Ethics. And he calls chapter three the, the origin and nature of the emotions. So he's going to discuss the emotions in great detail. And he certainly does. And he discusses love, hate, hope, fear, pity, envy, pride, ambition, and many more. And for each one of these, he's certainly using a very uh, geometric method. And what I mean is, um, he tries to explain all these different emotions and all the different emotions that people can have in terms of three primary emotions. And these emotions, these primary emotions, are desire, pleasure, and pain. And uh, I think he's, again, very persuasive man. And he manages to give a good case or a very good description, really quite a brilliant description of all the different human emotions in terms of those three primary emotions. So this is a very psychological chapter. It really is dealing with human psychology and what Spinoza thinks about human psychology. And it really is a rather amazing um, analysis at very early, uh, you know, this was a very, it was written in the uh, 17th century. And so this was a long time ago, but really quite a brilliant analysis of human emotion. Now, remember that for Spinoza, one of his main criticisms of the way that people understand man is that he believes many people put man outside of nature, as if man was something special, something different from everything else as if man were a kingdom within a kingdom, he, he describes it. And he doesn't think that man is a kingdom within a kingdom. He thinks that man is a part of nature. He's not external to nature. And this is precisely why he uses the geometric method. Bodies can be described geometrically, and so man ought to be described geometrically, um, because he's part of the same thing. He's subject to the same laws that the rest of nature is subject to. And so um, this is very important for Spinoza. Man is not something outside of nature. He's something very much within nature, part of nature, and he is subject to exactly the same laws. And in this sense, mankind is not free. And he doesn't, he's certainly rather harsh on the idea of free will. He thinks that perhaps this is quite a simple idea and it's certainly not the case because mankind is in nature. And just like everything else in nature is unfree, mankind is also unfree um, to a certain extent. But notice that the subtitle of this book is The Road to Inner Freedom. And so freedom is something that he discusses all the way through the book. And I think it's fair to say that one of his main aims with this book called Ethics is that he wants people to understand that rationality can, our reason, our rationality can help us to control our emotions. And in that way, um, we can become freer than we, uh, than perhaps some people are. Um, we can become, 
able to control our own actions to a certain extent. I mean, I've got to say, he really doesn't believe in freedom, but he does believe in it to a certain extent, to a limited extent. And he believes that to live a free life is the way to happiness as well. And so he describes two different kinds of emotions at the start of Ethics. Um, it's tempting to read Spinoza as just being critical of all emotions. But I think if you read him carefully, you'll see that although mo emotions are for the most part passive, and if you've watched the other classes on chapter two and chapter one, you'll remember that passive means externally caused. And that makes sense to me as a grammar teacher because passive things are caused by something else, whereas active things are active agents, they do the causing, they are the doers. And so passive emotions are externally caused by our situation, our, um, by our circumstances, whereas active emotions are self-caused. And it's active emotions that triumph over passive emotions, they overcome passive emotions. So emotions are not just passive. There's a certain part of uh, this um, chapter where he does make it very clear. He says that one emotion can only be overcome by another emotion. Yeah, and in that sense, we need active emotions to, to control passive emotions. But where do these active emotions come from? Well, they're connected to reason, to our rationality, and it's um, when we strive towards reason and rationality that we are able to approach active emotions. So um, I want to go through desire, pleasure and pain in a little more detail. Um, desire is the essence of man. And so this is, I suppose, modern psychologists would call it something like libido or something like that. But desire is the essence of man. And this desire is a striving to persist in one's being. In other words, a striving to go on, to continue living, to continue to survive. And this is why self-preservation is at the heart of Spinoza's ethics. It really is several times he talks about self-preservation self being the essence of man and this being the good for man. For any man, a good, it's good for him to persevere in his own being, to persist, to survive, to keep going. And of course, he's not just talking about man. He's talking about all the other things out there which have minds and bodies. Um, so all of, all of the animal kingdom he's talking about as well. Um, so desire is the principal, one of the three primary emotions, and it's this striving to persist in one's being. Um, and I think that this really reminds me of the utilitarians um, who come along later in philosophy and try to explain that good things are things which are useful to us and bad things are things which are not useful to us. Um, he really does approach the, the, the utilitarians and I think that they like Spinoza quite a lot. Um, now, a second thing to remember is that he actually puts good and evil, therefore, down to pleasure and pain. Now, I want you to remember about Epicurus, because really Spinoza took a lot from Epicurus and from the Stoics, from these two groups. He doesn't agree with both of them in all areas, of course, he's got his own philosophy. But he does take, he certainly likes this idea that good things are pleasurable things and bad things are painful things. So very simple ethical um, stance, really. This is perhaps one of the uh, most obvious ethical positions that good things are things which are, are pleasant and bad things are things which are painful. Um, now, of course, there are many arguments against this. This sounds like hedonism, but it's not actually. If you read Epicurus carefully, you'll see that he's certainly not a hedonist. Um, and he thinks that sometimes you should avoid um, short-term pleasures for long-term pleasures, for example. So don't think that he's a hedonist and certainly don't think that Spinoza, uh, Spinoza is a hedonist because it wouldn't be true. Now, pleasure and pain, he defines. He defines pleasure as the mind, and remember that mind and body are parallel. We did this in chapter two. Body can't determine mind, mind can't determine body. Bodies determine other bodies. Minds determine other minds. They only have a cause, a, a, a chain of causality in their own realm, but they both run along parallel. And what this means is 
if the body experiences pleasure, then the mind does too. And if the body experiences pain, then the mind does too, because they run in parallel. And I think we can all see that that is perhaps the case. Um, he points out that when the body's asleep, the mind is also in a state of torpor. It's, you know, not the same as when it's awake, the mind. And so he sees the body and the mind running in parallel. Um, and so this is quite important because pleasure is a, a mental and a, and, a, and a physical thing at the same time. So mind and body pass to greater perfection, he says, when they experience pleasure. But what does he mean by greater perfection? Well, one of the things he explains is that we we experience an increase in the power of activity of our mind and body when we feel pleasure. Now, what does it mean, an increase in the power of activity? Of course, he's referring to something active, our power of activity, but he does actually explain that there's an increase in the number of ways a mind or body can affect other minds or bodies. That's what he means by an increase in power of activity. And this makes a lot of sense to me because he's trying to show why, um, or I think that this ties in with why, um, you might be tempted to think that Spinoza thinks that mind is in all bodies, and I think he does. Um, but the mind is only, um, the mind is, is only simple or complex depending on how many ways it can affect other things. And we can see that a rock can't affect many other things in many ways. So in that sense, it doesn't have much of this power of activity and it doesn't have much of a mind. Whereas the human body, for example, is a very complex, highly complex um, collection of different parts, different organs. And so it has a massive number of ways that it can affect other minds and bodies. A massive number of ways, far, far more than any animal, for example. And in this sense, this is what he means by an increase, this is why he claims that an increase in the power of activity means an increase in the ways, the number of ways we can affect other minds and bodies. Okay, and pain is just a decrease in the power of activity. He actually says uh, something like, when the mind imagines its own lack of power, it's saddened by it. He doesn't like to feel like its, its power of activity is decreasing. And this is why we feel sadness at the same time as we feel pain. Um, so this is what he means by pleasure and pain. Now, he dis defines emotions such as love and hate in a really simple way. Uh, love for him is simply pleasure plus the idea of an external cause. And hate is simply pl pain plus the idea of an external cause. Um, now, in chapter three, he goes through all of these emotions in great detail, and he does point out that, that um, he does talk about vacillation quite often, which is where the human mind will feel totally opposite emotions towards the same thing at the same time. Um, so I think we've all felt this when we're in love, that you can very often love somebody and hate somebody to a great extent at the same time, one and the same person. So he certainly goes into great detail discussing that kind of thing and even discussing how it comes about, what causes um, love and hate towards the same object. Um, and he has a very uh, uh, persuasive way, a very um, interesting way of describing all these emotions. And uh, yeah, do, do get a book like this to, to um, read about it if you're interested in this kind of topic. Now, the whole book really is trying to, ex trying to explain how we can find freedom, how we can overcome a lot of our emotions. And the way to do so, the way to increase the power of our activity is to follow a rational path, a reasonable path. And really, I think Spinoza still, notice, still, still understands that the desire to be rational, to be reasonable, is still an emotion but it's an active emotion. It's something which is self-caused. It causes itself. Um, and there are good reasons to be rational when we look around, good reasons to, be, um, to overcome our emotions and take a step back and think carefully about what we do in life. Um, so a couple of other things. He does say that man is to man a god. And that's really quite a powerful sentence, I think. But what he wants to show is that nothing is more useful to man than another man. And for that reason, 
uh, society is a very important thing and it is reasonable and rational to come together in groups and set up towns and cities and states. It's a very reasonable thing to do. Now he was a big fan of Thomas Hobbes, the English philosopher. And if you uh, read his Leviathan, you'll see that Spinoza is in agreement with Hobbes in a lot of different ways about how, why, it's, um, why it's useful and why it's good for man to, uh, to form societies and why it's perhaps not so good, it's bad for man to go and live um, without society, without any other men, as a hermit far away from his companions. It actually makes life much harder and um, perhaps it doesn't lead to a very pleasant life, but quite a painful life. Okay, so to man there's nothing more useful than man. And one other reason why I really like Spinoza is because he mentions that a free man thinks of death least of all things, and his wisdom is a meditation of life um, and not of death. Now, the reason why I particularly like this, the fact that he recognises that death is not um, something good to, to dwell on or to think about, is because in philosophy, certainly the Stoics, for example, but modern philosophers like Heidegger and many others, uh, I think that they glorify death um, and they make death something um, like the end of philosophy. Um, the reason why we study philosophy is to understand death and cope with death and be able to um, yeah, deal with death, overcome it in some kind of way. And I'm not so sure that that's the case. The Stoics were big fans of suicide, for example, and Spinoza says that anybody who commits suicide is weak-minded. Um, they're doing a bad thing. Why is it bad? Because self-preservation is at the heart of ethics and there's nothing more, you know, killing yourself is obviously not really considering your own self-preservation. And so Spinoza is certainly not in, fav in favour of suicide, although the Stoics believed that death um, gave life meaning. Schopenhauer says something very similar. There's a lot of this going through philosophy that we've, that death gives life meaning and that um, death is a very important part of philosophy. But Spinoza seems to argue against that. He says that free men, and he means rational men, he means good men, um, these people think of death very little. There's no point in thinking about death. It's an unknowable part. Um, and so they think about life. They think about the universe, how the universe works. They're more interested in life, much more interested in life than in death. And that's very, very different uh, from most other philosophers. It's very rare that you get somebody who says that. And I think that most philosophers a little bit in, in, in a similar way to religion, they actually uh, speak a lot about death because, because it's a frightening thing and people find it a very painful thing to even think about and so they have to um, talk about it in order to deal with it, in order to make it something that perhaps it's not, but um, make it something that they can cope with, that they can deal with. Anyway, I'm going to stop uh, there for today. I think I've dealt with most of the topics that I've got on the board, but there are lots of different things that you can talk about concerning a book like this, and it is a very impressive book. I'll try to do, uh, I'll try to work on chapters four and five for the next class, and I think I'll do both those chapters together, and we'll focus more on how we can achieve this, this uh, limited sense, admittedly, but this sense of freedom, how we can overcome our emotions, and it really is by following the rational path, and it's certainly not an easy path, and Spinoza admits that, that um, it's something very difficult to do, um, overcoming your emotions, and I, I think that this is certainly the case. When I look around me, and when I look at myself, I realise that controlling my emotions is the hardest part, and of course we can only control emotions using other emotions, and so we'll never really control our emotions, but still there are I, I agree with Spinoza that there are happy emotions, pleasant emotions, and reasonable, rational emotions, whereas on the other hand, there are also passive emotions, which are when we allow life just to throw us around um, with it by, by external causes. Okay, so thanks everybody for watching this lesson. If you've enjoyed it, please give me a like and subscribe, and um, I hope to see everybody soon.